this brief presentation will be titled the, the Three Myths of Cycling Debunked, which is uh, something that I try and talk to the general audience about. Um, I am uh, George Liu, the Executive Director of the Urban Cycling Institute in uh, at the University of Amsterdam. And, uh, and what, what I do is I, uh, I'm working on my PhD in this field, uh, and I'm also putting out during this COVID time, like quite a few uh, online courses, and there's a YouTube channel. We tweet a lot. We're quite active on uh, social media, and uh, our mission is all about bring the science of cycling uh, to practice, uh, from research to practice, and back. So, if you're ready for the three myths of cycling debunked, uh, I'm going to go ahead in this presentation. It's a, a Dutch-centric uh, view but hopefully this will also uh, apply in your individual context. First, we start out with something quite common, ordinary, uh, that has somehow become a, a very, very commonplace uh, image in our society. It's a uh, hundred years ago, right? We have the, the first automobile was invented and here we are a hundred years later. And we have scenes like this, scenes of uh, huge amounts of money, investment, and, uh, and energy being poured into uh, human mobility. This is one example of the mobility just on the surface level, but you can also imagine the different ways that this picture and this idea can then be applied to all aspects, such as aviation, uh, marine mobility, and so forth. And this is really one of the biggest challenges in our time, is how to move from A to B uh, in a way that's friendly to our economy, to our, our standard of living. <laughs> I, this, this one always cracks me up, and it's the, the black hole of, uh, of urban transportation, right? This is the, the, the black hole theory of highway investment, which, it, it, which does led us to question what is the logic that we're using uh, with our government money, right? This is uh, highway investment is done mostly by public funds. Um, and I, I liken it to uh, the, the military industrial complex in a way, right? Where uh, it, especially back in, in the Cold War in the U.S., um, a lot of investment in weapons was, uh, was fed by the private sector. Uh, but through very big government contracts. And if we think about the relationship between the automobile industry and the government, right, it's kind of the same type of relationship. The government provides roads on which uh, you drive your cars, right? So it's, uh, it's providing a platform on which we can, at, at the same time, then uh, connect both the private and public sectors. And arguably, this is not the most efficient way to do it. And arguably, right, the spiral demonstrates um, the, 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 the falsity of this logic. So more highway congestion, as you've seen in the picture, uh, leads governments to react by adding more capacity, right? But we know that from research that this capacity is quickly taken up by even more uh, traffic on the roads. It's, uh, it's, it, it, there is near infinite demand for trips uh, because, what, because the price of using the roads is zero, right? And it, we are, I'm talking to a group of executives here. When you have the price of zero, basically uh, the, the demand, uh, you know, there's nothing to control the demand and the supply curve is straight up and down. And if you think about road space with a price of zero, from the user perspective, you have a really difficult economics uh, problems here, right? And this is partially uh, why I became interested in the idea of uh, road space pricing, because you know traffic congestion uh, doesn't have to be uh, an unsolved problem in this world with electronic tolling, etc. We have uh, solutions that can really affect the way that we use our road space and solve this problem of having uh, road space cost uh, have a marginal cost of zero, which is not really the society's cost. So what happens if we keep investing in this spiral? 
right? The, the, what, what happens here is we fall into this black hole, but what happens when we reverse the spiral, right? And this is what my presentation will talk to you today, is that reversing the spiral requires a completely different logic than what got us into here. So uh, this is the alternative, right? This is an alternative where mobility and placemaking happens in the same spot, right? Um, this is an alternative where if we choose to build cities that, uh, that cater to pedestrians and, and, and people on bikes, then we can create spaces that are much more activated than the, the, the highways that we see being built today. And arguably, it's more economically vibrant, plus we provide a placemaking function where we don't drive away people from our cities, but instead complement the people who are there. So the three myths that I will go through today, number one, uh, I'm, I'm studying bicycle infrastructure. So build it and they will come. There's the argument going around in cities, uh, especially uh, during the times of COVID, uh, where we see cities building quite uh, a, an extensive network of bicycle infrastructure, right? That cycling replaces driving. Is this true? Uh, can cycling alone be the solution to the black hole of traffic uh, investments? And the idea that if cities uh, write a plan and follow it, that this is in itself sufficient to bring about uh, cycling in the urban environment. So let's tackle the first myth, build it and they will come, right? And this is where my experience as a uh, urban planner comes in, right? And, and it's, it, it's this idea of combining the, the physical and spatial with uh, the behavioral and social, that building bicycle infrastructure is perhaps not enough, but if we combine it with how people move about, that we can come to a solution. So this is an interesting map of the city of Amsterdam. And in the center, you see uh, the city center, which is uh, on the left uh, on these green bars. Um, the light green is uh, mode share by car. Uh, the middle green is uh, percent of trips by bicycle. And then the dark green is percent of trips by public transport. And what is clear from this picture is that we like to think about you know Amsterdam and the Netherlands as uh, the cycling capital uh, together with Copenhagen uh, of the world right but within this picture you can also see that uh, indeed when it comes to cycling even within the same city you can see there's much more much more uh, bicycle mobility in the city center and that the, the, the way that we move is highly dependent on the urban form that we have created, right? And, and this urban form is highly dependent on uh, how governments choose uh, to plan their cities. So it's likely that in your own city um, that you will also have different segments um, where in the city center, you see a very different way of people moving uh, about rather than compared to the outskirts that in the city center of any city, there's more people walking about compared to, in general, more driving out in the suburbs. Perhaps that is a, a nature of the city uh, that we're building, but perhaps there's something that we can also do to deliberately affect change. So to illustrate this point further, um, you can see that um, if, if you have bicycle infrastructure in your city, you can see that this is in fact, uh, what looks like a, a perfect piece of bicycle infrastructure. You have a separated uh, a bike path on the side and a roadway in the middle. In any context, this would be uh, quite excellent. But uh, the, we're looking at, um, this would be one of the bicycle networks out in the suburb. But it's not necessarily what uh, the separation and the explicit uh, accentuation of uh, cycling and walking that is necessarily the thing that will get people to come. In fact, if you look at this streetscape, there is no bicycle infrastructure at all, right? That, uh, but in fact, this environment is much more attractive to a higher number of people who choose to go by bike and, and number of people who choose to walk. So this kind of represents a conundrum um, and two different approaches to city planning. 
And the way we can design our streets is represented by do we have to separate everything, which is very much the modernist approach, right? So we provide each mode with their own uh, way of getting about. Um, or do we kind of embrace the chaos of what is fundamentally uh, so advantageous of uh, city center environments that we, we try and mix modes as, as much as possible uh, while using traffic calming for, for cars and using leveraging the economic activity and the, uh, the frequency of social interactions on the street to then further increase the economic value of what is on the street. Because as you can see here, this is a very lively use of uh, public space. Um, and in fact, here the restaurants are benefiting from the environment. And I would argue that the people sitting outside in the patio are benefiting from uh, people watching on the streets that are passing by. So uh, something to think about. Um, and if you're transport planners, you, you probably already know about this model. But for those um, who are interested, it's, uh, it's how we look at the transport system um, and how our, the way that we move relates to um, the way that our cities are built, right? Um, and that our transport system is intimately connected with the activities that we do uh, and the accessibility of where we need to go. So for example, if, uh, you, if the closest place to get groceries is five kilometers away, right from from your house then in a way your activities are forced to be further apart and if your activities are forced to be further apart then naturally that will also lead to um, you having to travel more and of the minimum you can get away from traveling is a, a, a large distance naturally you're going to choose to drive a car right so the I'm trying to illustrate the connection between how our cities are built uh, how far we are from our destinations with the idea that we get to choose how we move. And the further away things are, the more likely we are to favor uh, driving, which then we get back into the black hole uh, of traffic highway investment. So that was the first myth. Build it and they will come, right? Um, so it's not necessarily true that we have to build separated bicycle infrastructure to get people cycling. Um, but here's the caveats, right? Connected, meaningful, daily destinations in a robust network. And through, uh, over time, we will attract uh, more people uh, who cycle and walk. And uh, this is interesting. And perhaps in the last 10 months or so has been really accelerated by uh, this COVID pandemic. And it appears that the, the, the cities who are building bicycle infrastructure are seeing a huge increase in uh, recreational use. Right. So that we're seeing a use of not just people riding to the store, um, but also people traveling because, well, they got to get out of the house. And that's one of the important considerations for for these leisure modes as well. Um, cycling replaces driving. So if there is the black hole of uh, road space investment, uh, would we think about um if, if, if using the bicycle can indeed replace the automobile. And indeed, if you look at your, um, your city, it's likely that it's probably very automobile and public transport dominated. So how do we insert, um, if we want, a, a cycling into that system? So this is an image of a, a train station uh, in the Netherlands. And you can see what's powerful here is that there's a, a lot of bikes parked outside. And it's, uh, it's not, in the Netherlands, it's like a, a marriage of convenience. But if you, if you really think about how the system evolved, it's quite a powerful way to leverage uh, the train system as, or the public transport system, such as a BRT, um, to get from uh, A to B over longer distances. This uh, might be interesting. This is a uh, chart of the different... Uh, stations in the Netherlands this is probably uh, applicable to you know in general any type of train network um, especially I think in Switzerland it's a very big train network also very dense and what this figure shows is that the uh, catchment area of uh, pedestrian how many people 
live within one kilometer of all train stations? And then how many people live within uh, 75 kilometers of all train stations? 7.5 kilometers. And this just makes the argument that 81% of all people in the Netherlands live within 7.5 kilometers uh, of a train station. And the argument here is that if you can get to a train station quickly, then that train network, if you have a robust train or bus rapid transit network, can then transport you at a much faster rate to anywhere else that you're, you need to go. But the challenge is really getting to a station. And as we know, the most public transport systems are set up in a way that get you from nowhere to no place, right? And, and basically, uh, we can use cycling as a way to solve the, the, the front door to train station problem. And if you think that 80% of everyone lives within uh, 7.5 kilometers of a train station, right, then you start to think about what impact that, that micromobility um, and e-bikes could have on the system. Um, that, in fact, you don't have to ride you know, 30, 40 kilometers on an e-bike, but in fact, if you can make it easier for people to get to a portal uh, for getting onto transit in a reliable and time-effective way, that if you can time your commute so that you arrive at the train station within 30 seconds of when the door closes, then you can really offer a, a, a novel way to, um, to move away from automobile transport. And for places like Switzerland and, and, and perhaps Germany, this could be a, a very powerful way to think about uh, replacing car travel. So uh, this is your conventional, you know, bike, uh, perhaps your bike pedestrian range. And then on the right, you know, it's, it's an idea that you, you have much more choice uh, if you are able to electrify, you know, these access modes. That if you're able to uh, move faster through your environment, it's actually, you know, the, the area that you're able to cover is, um, it's something like, what's the math, you know, like a, like a circle. Is, is the pi r squared uh, right of, of the of the radius. So if you're able to move more quickly, you actually access more destinations at a uh, squared uh, function, right? So it's not linear, but it is a squared function. Uh, this is the the same idea as the uh, as a chart that I showed you earlier, but in a map form. And this is the, the Dutch train network. It's very well served. So what's the caveat here? Cycling replaces driving? No, cycling plus a dense and high service train network can possibly replace driving. Because there are people who uh, commute 30, 40, 100 kilometers to get to work. And, uh, and for that segment of the population where you don't live within cycling distance, that we should think about having cycling and public transit as a complement to a healthy urban transportation system, right? Okay, let's get to the, the third one. Uh, write a plan and follow it. So this is perhaps aimed at the, the city administrators um, <laughs> on this call. And uh, I think this was, I th the, the Dutch kind of really loved to plan and uh, and you can see it, it's 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 historically based on the because they've always had a, a fight with the the water and uh, kind of damming the water and making sure the uh, the water is well managed has been a his history of the Dutch and therefore you know urban planning has become a large history of the Dutch but with that urban planning also comes uh, you know white's mast uh, plans uh, for these cities and, and, and power to execute these plans. So when we had urban renewal around the world in the 1970s, which was another you know, way to, to say build highways through less desirable neighborhoods, the same thing has happened in the Netherlands as well. Right? So uh, there was a time when, when there were plans to raise quite a few cities, not just in the Netherlands, but around Europe. Um, and it was fashionable at the time, fashionable at the time, to build highways, uh, and even at the expense of uh, mowing down whatever buildings are in its way. And this is one of the examples of uh, a, 
a neighborhood in Amsterdam going undergoing the same transformation here. So this is um, we're going to connect to another issue, perhaps, um, of urban mobility is that the adverse impact that automobility has had on public health, right? In terms of not just obesity and lack of exercise, but also of uh, traffic deaths. And this is, uh, in general, the number of traffic deaths in the Netherlands. Um, and you can see it really peaked in 1972 with 3,500. And it has uh, gone down ever since. So the, the first uh, increase here before the 1970s was really doing uh, it, uh, due in lar a large part uh, to the growth of automobiles, right? So a lot of people were, were, were buying cars and driving them on the roads. But then what, what's interesting is that globally, um, traffic deaths has really started to fall and, and fall, follow the same pattern. Um, the, the same pattern then leads us to question, well, uh, what happened here, right? Partially because of good road design and, and better road design, uh, but the number of uh, vehicle miles didn't decrease after the 1970s. So it was actually a, another causal factor, right? Uh, and in the 1970s, we had the oil crisis, um, which uh, impacted all around the world. And the Dutch have, uh, during that time, taken the advantage to really rethink their traffic policy. Uh, if you look at a, a, a street in 1981, right, on the left, uh, and you look at a, a modern Dutch street uh, in 2016, you can clearly see the, the differences that has happened. So uh, the number of vehicle kilometers traveled hasn't really gone down between uh, these two eras. In fact, it's probably much higher in 2016, but the way that we manage traffic uh, within cities especially has really changed uh, in the meantime. Again here, 1973, and uh, a similar uh, transformation happened on this street as well, right? So, um, so basically the, the general uh, mood of keeping uh, automobiles away from the, the city center um, and, and more towards periphery peripheries has had a, a positive impact on uh, urban life uh, in the city centers. But that also brings up the question of, uh, you know, I, what be, just because we've removed the problem from the city centers, you know, do we have a new set of problem in the peri periphery that by, uh, by making the urban center more walk friendly, do we then, uh, you know, give an incentive to the people who, uh, who like to drive to move further out. And of course, that is a very valid question. And perhaps uh, we don't have clear data to kind of follow people and, and where they go in terms of their preferences. But overall, um, I think we also want to look at design from a human perspective, uh, which is um, kind of what I'm doing with, with my PhD, is, is looking at this idea of experience and, and using people's behavior as a blueprint uh, to see how we can change intersections and how we can design cities differently. So here is a, a, route, a route map that traces uh, cyclists as they uh, go past an intersection in Amsterdam. And I want you to notice this is very interesting. They don't follow the way that they're supposed to go, right? Like if you're making a left turn, you should technically in this design go all the way across and then wait for a green and then go left, right? But you see like people ducking this design all the time and they just cut right through. Similarly, the pink and similarly, you also have the same problem in the green. So how do we design to accommodate people's behavior rather than trying to uh, wrangle people's behavior to uh, the intersection uh, and the, the mechanical environment? And perhaps one of the solutions is to change uh, the, the primary focus of design, going from going from how we design for people, going from a design that forces people to uh, conform to the logic of an intersection, to an intersection that then uh, is molded around the desires of the people using it. And you can see here are some quite subtle changes, right? These are some old traffic islands here. Um, this was the old island 
uh, and an old island here, and then this was much bigger here. So they managed to remap this and do away completely, right? Because people are going, who are going left were actually trying to go left directly. So why not just take away this traffic uh, island here, rearrange uh, the, the signal cycle, and make it easier for people to make a direct left? After all, the people who ride bikes through this intersection are, are, are many times more than the, the drivers who are going through this uh, by car. So if that's the case, then the primary design vehicle really should be um, the users who are using this the most. And this is kind of one of the results that we got, right? So similarly, you have um, a lot of people crowding here, especially with COVID, right? Uh, with social distancing, you really don't want people bunching up at intersections. And what can you do? You can just cut out this whole concrete island. It doesn't really need to be there. Uh, but it's something that was there because of uh, habit and tradition. We, we kind of figured out how to, um, you know, win some more space by looking at our designs critically. So uh, write a plan and, and follow it. Maybe not. Maybe it, writing a plan is more of an iterative process, right? To, to, it helps to listen and watch the people, to experiment, um, to follow uh, what people want from their city. Uh, think about uh, the uses of the street critically, uh, and then as, as an iterative cycle to rewrite the plan. And as we come back to this, uh, the image of uh, the neighborhood that was raised in the 1970s, I thought it, it would be good to reflect on that with massive power, uh, right, by, by the planning authorities in, in government. Uh, there, there's, there's also massive power to do uh, to do away with entire chunks of neighborhood. But as part of an iterative process, um, it, it seems like with citizen pushback especially, that um, many of these projects were, were able to be stopped completely. Um, and for that one neighborhood, it was too late. But if you were to go back to the plans, perhaps even the plans in your city, um, you may think that most of the highways have been implemented you know, in, in its entirety. But if you go back to the plans in your city, you, you, you'll be very surprised to learn that probably a majority of the large infrastructure projects that were planned and were popular back in the 1970s were probably stopped you know, by, uh, by the turn of uh, the 1980s and the 90s. Uh, I know this is definitely true for Dutch cities, for a lot of American cities. Um, but it's this idea of always consulting, you know, uh, citizens and this idea that uh, our mood and the way that we view cities uh, and public space and the role of government is a, is a constantly evolving process. So, yes, uh, planners do plan, uh, you know, and, and we do have a long term vision based on the era that you're in. Um, but one of the roles of government and the people really is to uh, think about how these plans can be iterated uh, and be aware of what uh, that what comes in the future um, uh, that we don't project you know what what our vision is now uh, 15 years in the future and fail to revisit these plans so um, some key lessons here and i want to end off with this so it seems like infrastructure works, right? Uh, but combined carefully with uh, consideration of the urban fabric. So we saw that the, the way that infrastructure can be built in a very car-friendly environment that accommodate bikes, but what people really want you know, for a vibrant neighborhood is actually, um, uh, is actually liveliness, right? And it's not necessarily provided in uh, a context, you know, uh, by putting infrastructure next to a highway. That uh, there's huge potential for, for cycling and transit, right? So, uh, you know, if you're thinking like a, a, a company like Bombardier, right, how do you sell transit to municipal governments, right? They're tight on budget. And it, perhaps one of the ways to, to sell transit in a city where no one wants to take transit is to illustrate the, the symbiosis, that if you're able to replace some of the car drivers um, uh, to people who walk or, or ride bikes, 
then naturally you will develop a market for uh, your transit system, right? And and thinking about the symbiosis together with with how you build cities around uh, transit development is is perhaps a, a good way to uh, think about how we can propel cities into the future. Um, and and then you know as we move into this. 21st century of, of urban planning, uh, it, it has become much more fashionable to do this uh, plan, experiment, observe uh, type of uh, consultation and planning. Uh, that's it's much more on a short cycle. That much more involves people. Um, but you know, there's there's also something a bit insidious about about this short term process, right? Um, that um, that. As we move on to an era of big data, uh, that uh, that governments uh, are really responding to these models uh, and and data collected from people, uh, and that we have to be, be careful who possesses these data, um, you know who's uh, who's in control of this, whose interests uh, these are in, and uh, and definitely be sure that these do reflect the will of the people that we're designing for. So here's a bunch of links uh, to our uh, social media and, uh, and Coursera offerings. Uh, thanks uh, for the content from uh, our team uh, who provided many of the images uh, from the slide. And uh, a couple of things before I open up for Q&A. There's the Unraveling the Cycling City course uh, from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, so it's, it's free with a paid certificate if you're so interested. We're almost uh, up to 10,000 people <laughs> enrolled in that course. So uh, it'd be great uh, if, if, uh, if you want to contribute and help us to get there. And then for the people who want to get into the profession of designing bicycle infrastructures uh, that we have just uh, funded by the EU. So this is now free, uh, Designing the Cycling City, which is at designthecyclingcity.com. And I believe my past self has spoken much more eloquently than my present self in these courses. So, uh, but I'm really here for the Q and A, and I hope this has uh, stimulated some thought. And I want to open up the floor to you guys.